So yeah, today's question comes directly from the mouth of Jesus, and it is the question, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts, which in and of itself is a good question. Um, but we're going to look at it in context, in the context of Matthew chapter 9, the first eight verses. It says in the bulletin, the first nine verses, it's the first eight verses. If you want to, you can open up a pew Bible and read along. I'm reading from a 2011 edition. Those are the 1984 edition. Don't worry, there's just a couple changes in the wording. Otherwise, you can just follow along on the screen. But before we do any of that, I want to pray. Lord, we do acknowledge that your, um, your word is a lamp unto our feet and that the things of this world can, are going to fail and fade, but your word will remain forever. And it is in that perspective, in that awe, that we now come to your word and we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would uh, yeah, quicken it to our hearts. Help us to understand and not just understand with our heads, but actually follow you with all of our being. And all your people say... Amen. So Matthew chapter 9, the first eight verses. Jesus stepped into a boat and crossed over and came to his own town. Some men brought him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts... Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, Get up, take your mat, and go home. Then the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God, who had given such authority to man. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. So, I don't know how it works in your household, um, but in my household, I'm the official onion cutter. Andrea certainly knows how to cut onions, um, but if I'm around, she would prefer that I do it um, because for whatever reason, my eyes seem to have a little bit more tolerance, not complete tolerance, but a little bit more tolerance of that chemical reaction that takes place. You know, when you cut an onion, it opens up the cells that are in there and there's like this chemical reaction and these like acids vaporize. And, and anyway, you, you know how it works. You cut an onion and you cry. Um... And I don't want to cut onions today, but I was thinking about this passage and thinking about onions because another thing that we do with onions besides eat them is to notice all those various layers of the onion. And we often use onions as a metaphor to, to, to talk about sort of peeling back beyond the surface of things. And that uh, sometimes that's, that's a person, sometimes that's, that's a concept, um, sometimes um, that's part of what the Bible has to say. And in the Bible, in the Bible, um, there's various headings above the texts, various headings above the text. So uh, I don't know how it looks exactly in the Pew Bible, but there's various headings above different chunks of text. And hopefully you know that's not original to the Bible, right? Those aren't parts of the Bible. The Bible was just the text through and through. And when people translate it, they like to add headings or titles above different chunks of the passage in order to um, sort of label it, make it easier to parse, easier to you know, digest, in the, you know, metaphorically speaking. Um, but uh, regardless of what Bible you're reading, I think that translators have this unenviable task of trying to summarize a passage using a pithy little phrase and that that pithy little phrase has all sorts of downfalls, one of which is that it tends to be a very superficial description of what's going on. Superficial meaning on the surface, kind of like the first layer of an onion, when in fact the scriptures are indeed like an onion. The heading or the title above the passage might tell you something about that outer layer, but you know how we treat the outer layer of the onion. We tend to 
take that off and discard that because we're more interested at the valuable stuff that's the deeper that you go. And that's what I want to suggest to you with respect to this passage and with respect to the ways in which there might be a heading above this particular title, but above this particular passage, because some of them say Jesus heals a paralytic. Some of them say a paralyzed man healed. And on one hand, that's a really accurate description. I have a suspicion that many everyday readers of the Bible come to this passage, um, whether out of convenience or out of haste, and they merely accept this superficial description of the passage. And if we do that, we think, okay, hey, Jesus healed a paralyzed man. And then we're not sure what that means for us, because most of us aren't paralyzed. And we think, well, that was kind of a waste of time reading the Bible. Anyone ever read the Bible and come away thinking, hmm, didn't get much out of that? Does anybody ever do that? I think that's one of the downfalls of having this sort of superficial sense of what this passage is about. He heals a paralytic. Okay. Um, or we might even go one step further than that and say to ourselves, gosh, that doesn't seem to happen anymore. This whole healing bit. And then we either wish we lived back then and could see in our, with our own two eyes, physically, tangibly, what Jesus was up to in people's lives, or um, we become cynical about the power of God to physically heal anybody in this present moment. And I wonder, did anybody ever read the Bible like that? Right? You read the passage of the Bible and you come away, hmm, not only what does this mean for me, but this doesn't seem to happen anymore. But what if there's more going on here? What if we don't have to allow ourselves to be sort of trapped by the heading, which is nothing more than the outer layer of the onion, the superficial description, and what if we can peel back sort of beyond that superficial layer and get to something even more important, be able to see even more of what's going on? Because, it's, yeah, he healed a, paralytic, a paralyzed man, but he did much more than that. And so I want to ask ourselves, you know, what if there's something more going on here? And what is it if there's something more going on here? And I want, to, I want to read the passage again, a passage that's not just about a paralyzed man being healed. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Some men brought him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, "'Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven.'" At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, and go home. And then the man got up, and went home. And when the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and they praised God who had given such authority to man or to a man. And now I'm not sure what you heard that time, but hopefully you heard some things in addition to the fact that there was a paralyzed man who was healed. So for instance, um, maybe we could give the passage this heading that, whoops, Jesus forgives and heals a paralyzed man. That he didn't just heal the guy. That's not what this passage is about. This is about Jesus saying to this guy that his sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. And in fact, that's the central part of the controversy in the passage. That the quote-unquote teachers of the law don't seem to be overly caught up in what's happening around the healing. So much as the fact that they are caught up in the fact that Jesus said your sins are are forgiven. And so maybe an appropriate heading for the passage would be people accuse Jesus of blasphemy. Not just that Jesus healed a paralyzed man, Jesus forgives and heals a paralyzed man, and people accuse Jesus of blasphemy. That's even more at the heart of this text if you peel back that first layer. Right? Because this isn't just about a paralyzed man. This is about what does and does not happen 
and, and not about what does and does not happen to him. It's about the reaction that people have because of Jesus' interaction with him. So some people accuse him of blasphemy, and not just people, but religious leaders. So we might say the heading should read, the religious leaders accuse Jesus of blasphemy. And if we're noticing people's reactions, we could also say that in addition to the religious leaders accusing him of blasphemy, the crowds praise God. So what if the heading above the text before you read it just says, the crowds praise praise God? Get at a little bit deeper meaning of what's going on, that this isn't just about a paralyzed man. This is about reactions or responses to the work and the words of Jesus. This is about reactions and responses to the work and the words of Jesus. And, um, and as you can see, I, I don't know, I think this is a fun game to play. What heading would you attach? I encourage you, next time you read your Bible, when you come to the beginning of a passage, you'll see there's a heading there. And I want you to wonder, hmm, that might be an accurate description on the surface of what's happening here, but what else is going on here? And one of the ways you can actually study the Bible is to come up with different headings that you would put on what this passage actually says. Because it will help you get beyond that superficial layer into the deeper meaning. That this isn't just about Jesus healing a paralyzed man. It's also about the religious leaders accusing Jesus of blasphemy. It's about the crowds praising God. And if we keep peeling it back and keep getting further and further toward the core of what it's about, um, we'll notice other things, including the fact that this passage seems to be a lot about authority. I might even go so far as to give it this heading, a statement about authority. That it's not just about a paralyzed man, this is a statement about authority. That what if they had used that as a heading? Because not only do verses nine and, uh, I mean, verses six and eight of chapter nine talk about this authority, but the whole buildup to this passage is all about authority. So if you still had your Bible open, you could go back. And if you went back to the beginning of chapter five, chapters five, six, and seven are all the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' most well-known teaching, this giant speech that he gives. And at the end of that, in chapter 7, when we come to the end of it and he stops speaking, there are two extra verses at the end of chapter 7 which say this. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. So that's the end of chapter 7. And then, of course, what comes after chapter 7? Chapter 8, which includes a lot more about authority. So if you grant me a little bit of license, a little bit of freedom here, beyond what it might say as the headings in any particular Bible, um, these are some of the headings that I would ascribe to the next parts in chapter 8. Okay, so, um, you know, at the end of chapter 7, we know Jesus has just spoken with authority. Beginning of chapter 8, there's a leper who trusts his authority. So he has this encounter directly after the mountain, the Sermon on the Mount experience with this leper, and the leper says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. The leper trusts his authority. Then right after that, he has an encounter with a centurion, a centurion who is subject to the authority of another, right? And the centurion says to him, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And that's his way of say, showing his faith in Jesus' authority that you don't even need to come with me to my house. If you just say it, it will be so. And so the centurion trusts his authority. And then the next little bit of the passage, Jesus is healing other people. He's exercising authority. And then the next little passage is this strange little thing that fits in here, the cost of following Jesus. Hmm, like I wonder why that comes up right now. He certainly said something about it in the Sermon on the Mount, but it also has everything to do with this authority bit, that there's a cost to following Jesus. He's basically saying, do you really want to trust this authority? The leper has done so. The centurion has done so. What about you? Will you trust this authority? And he's building on the end of the Sermon on the Mount even, which says the foolish man, the wise man, he says, 
<laughs> he wants them to listen to his words. And the wise man is like the, who listens to his words is like the wise man who built his house upon the rock, right? Trusts those things that the winds come and the rains fall. That house won't go anywhere because it's been built upon the rock. The foolish man is like that who built his house on sand and the winds rose and the floods came and beat against that house and it fell. Why? Because it didn't trust Jesus and his words. The leper has done so, centurion has done so, he demonstrates more of it through healing, and then there's a cost to following this Jesus. And then what comes after that? He quells a storm, he exercises authority over the natural world, and then he exercises authority over the unseen world, over these two demons that then get cast out. That's the end of chapter 8. He exercises authority over evil in that process. And then we come to the passage that we're about. And then once you know it, the passage after us, which is the last line I'm going to put up there, the passage after the one we're looking at today is that a tax collector, Matthew, trusts Jesus' authority. And if you think that's not a commentary on authority, then you're probably missing something, right? The tax collector, like the centurion, is subject to the Roman authorities, So who has authority? Well, Jesus has authority. You can't miss it. Authority in his teaching. Authority over diseases, even at a distance, right? The centurion. Uh, Authority over demons. Authority over the natural world. Authority over evil. So, yes, the heading for this passage might just be a statement about authority, or it could just as well be Jesus exercises authority Many of us have some negative views relative to authority, whether that be because authority was misused in our younger years or because of our distaste for authoritarian leaders um, like Putin or whoever else. But what if there's a different kind of authority? What if instead of abusing authority, the one with the most authority in the universe actually exercises authority that has everything to do with this sort of strange and compelling power of love and freedom and forgiveness, then what would your reaction be? Because as I said, this isn't just about the paralyzed man. It's about the reactions to the work and the words of Jesus. So Jesus exercises authority and different people react different ways. That's one of the headings we could use for this passage because some of the people are like the people who brought the paralyzed man to Jesus, people who have faith in the highest authority, but for others, they doubt Jesus' authority. They're wrestling with Jesus' authority. And the reason they are in this particular case, and the reason we might is because when Jesus exercises authority, he's actually saying much more than meets the eye because he says there in verse six, I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And so if we can peel back, you know, kind of another layer of the onion, this isn't just about a paralyzed man who gets healed. This is about him exercising authority and people responding in different ways, authority that goes all the way back to chapter seven. And this is Jesus making this very bold claim about where his authority comes from. Referring to himself as the son of man goes all the way back to the book of Daniel when Daniel had this vision. In my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like the like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days, that is God the Father, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So to refer to himself as the son of man is not just to refer to himself as the son of God or the Messiah, the anointed one. It is to also refer to this given authority, glory, and sovereign power, that that will be one of the ways in which you know this is the son of man. So one of the ways that we could label this passage is Jesus makes his claim as the Messiah. On the surface, it looks like, oh, this is Jesus healing a paralyzed man. This is Jesus forgiving and healing a paralyzed man. 
This is people accusing him of blasphemy. Why? Because he's making his claim as the Messiah, the anointed one, the savior of the world, God in the flesh. So this isn't just the healing of a paralyzed man. This is a provocation by the Messiah. The provocation that he has the capacity, the authority to declare that sin is a beaten foe and just send it away. It's interesting, the word forgive, where he says your sins are forgiven, the word forgive there literally means send away. Sending all of our sins off into a far region that will be forgotten forever, which seems to be what was needed in this case. It's not always the case in all the healings that we see that Jesus is up to, but it certainly was here, that his paralysis seems to be the result of some kind of sin in his life. And I think every single one of us can relate to that. That whether we're being judgmental or lustful or jealous or gluttonous or we're addicted, whatever it happens to be, it can absolutely paralyze us. Can it not? One of the ways it does that is that we can have this gnawing sense of guilt makes us want to hide makes us think we're nothing. Or we can have this tremendous sense of impurity and it makes us want to just stop everything and avoid everybody. And when we're in that state, that paralyzed state, we need someone with the ability to do something. Somebody with the authority to command that which seems to be commanding us. Someone with the authority to command that which seems to be commanding us. We need someone to send away those sins and bring new life. Which is why we might say, this is what this passage is about. The Messiah provokes paralyzed people. And I like the alliteration Provokes paralyzed people. How is he provoking them? He's asking this question. Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? And one of the evil thoughts that they're entertaining is that Jesus doesn't really have this power. And that we can be the same way. That we're stuck there. And there's no one with the authority to free us from our paralysis. And we can get stuck believing that Jesus isn't who he said he is. And that he can't just send that junk away. And so why do you entertain evil in your hearts? The Messiah provoking paralyzed people saying, what if, what if it could be different? What if this really is good? What if you really could rise up? Because in this story, isn't it interesting, the language used three times and three times over for what Jesus tells the paralyzed man to do would automatically remind Matthew's readers of the language that was used in hearing the connection with Jesus' resurrection. If they've read it, they've seen it, they're reading this passage, he says, get up, and the man arose. These are the same words that are used for Jesus' own resurrection. And he's saying, when sin is dealt with at whatever level, then resurrection at whatever level can't be far behind. That Jesus wants to cast out and send away all the sin that exists in my life and in your life. He wants us to hear this message, your sins are forgiven. And I put it in quotes there because it's what he says, right? But this could also be the heading. We come to this heading and it says, Jesus heals a paralyzed man. What if you came to your Bible and it just said, your sins are forgiven? Do you believe it? That's essentially what the question is saying. That he didn't just come to defeat sin so that you could have a free ticket to the afterlife. He came so that sin could be dealt with and that so it would stop paralyzing you and paralyzing me and to not trust or entertain evil in our own hearts, but to trust his authority. And so we might read the passage and just see the surface level. 
and wonder, what, gosh, what does this have to do with me? Or, gosh, why do you need to heal people anymore? Or we can peel back that layer a little bit and see that it's more than that. This is about Jesus' claim to be a Messiah and that some people accuse him of being a blasphemer. Other people praise God. And why do they praise God? Because your sins are forgiven. And this is the way I know it's not as pithy. This is the way I would say it. Jesus, the Messiah, releases people from the paralyzing grip of sin. Amen? Amen. And so if you haven't heard that message, may you hear it today. And if you needed to hear it again today because you have a paralyzing, some sin has you in its paralyzing grip, may you hear it again today. And not entertain the evil thought in your head that it's not true, but actually be provoked by Jesus to believe that it is true. And when we come to this table, one of the things that you're accepting is that it is true. And that you're asking God, God, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. I I believe you can free me from the grip of this paralyzing sin. Help me in my unbelief and ingest what Jesus has done for you. Because this is the business that he's in. This is, he has authority to do this. I don't have authority to absolve you or free you or send away your sin. And nobody else in this room does. But he does. Let's pray. Jesus, as best we can, we want to acknowledge that you have all authority. And to the extent that we can't, give us the power that we could. We want to be like that paralyzed man and his friends, knowing that you have the power, you have the capacity, and that out of the love of your heart, you have the desire to see us rise up. And we want to hear those words. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And I pray for anyone here this morning who needs to hear those words again. Your sins are forgiven. Unstop their ears, Holy Spirit, and help them to hear it within the depths of their being, myself included. And Lord, as we come to this table, receive your grace and your goodness. May it sink deep, deep, deep within our bones and run through our veins that you are the Messiah and by your power, by your authority, we're welcomed into your kingdom. May we be like all the whole crowd at the end praising you. And all your people say, amen.